I'm, I'm Tim Hill of the Open Data Institute and the Open Active Project therein. Uh, Nick. Uh, hello, Nick Evans uh, um, uh, on the ODI Open Active Project and also working at IMEI. Uh, both Charlie Clarks. <laughs> uh, Charlie Clark, uh, Chief Commercial Officer at um, Playway, so I lead on everything sort of client-facing, client-side from a Playway's perspective. Fantastic. Uh, Chris? Chris Northfield, London Support, leading on Open Sessions work. Uh, Tom? Tom Marley, uh, co-founder, played. And Josh? Uh, Josh, software developer at Playways. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, the topic of this call is safeguarding, uh, which is obviously um, an important issue. Um, and I think it's a difficult one to address, partly because in fact, it's not really, um, it's not purely a technical question, right? There's the representation, which is in some ways fairly straightforward. Uh, but the domain or the requirements are fairly complicated. Um, first of all, is everybody seeing my screen right now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the initial proposal was made some time ago back in September by Nick and we've already talked about it a bit. Um, I'll give a brief summary if Nick wants to jump in and nuance that, that would be great. Um, essentially what was envisaged was a kind of simple ecosystem whereby we had opportunity publishers, obviously, so those are the people who are bound by and want to live up to safeguarding regulations. And we had certification publishers, which could be a range of different organizations who had certifying authorities. So I think the model that was being thought of here was mostly something like Clubmark. And they would publish two kinds of document. Um, one of which would be the actual certifications and the definitions of those, and the other of which would be a feed aligning those certifications with given organizations or given organizations and the activities that they were providing. Um, and there was an, an additional nuance whereby embedded markup could be used to identify which organization uh, a published page was coming from. So we had an ecosystem that was kind of two publishers of different kinds and two outputs on each of those. Um, and there was, uh, I think, some fairly fine-grained work about what the content of each of those representations was. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Nick? Um, only the um, recent observation um, out of the back of some of the MCR work, and I guess it's a shame no one's representing that here, I don't think, but um, I think we've got, we, there's, a, there's an interesting trend, which is that this, this work has been kind of um, discussed for a while. Um, and the same requirements um, seem to kind of keep recurring in different forms, um, but the, it's the same requirements. So BBC Get Inspired, Change for Life, MCR, um, the Sport England, recent Sport England campaign uh, for virtual, and I will if you will, a berry, um, all examples where they had kind of said, we're going to have an authority which is going to vet activities um, and, that, and that's going to be the way that we decide what's in or out of, this, of, our, of our service. Um, and interestingly, more recently MCR, but I guess then following the trend of all the others and then Sport England with virtual, um, one at a time everyone seems to have decided that actually it's too expensive and resource intensive to do that process. Um, and Clubmark's another example of that, where, where the Clubmark pro program didn't continue. Um, so it's interesting because there seems to be an ambition across all the organizations named that um, they were to do that. Um, but in every case, if they were doing it, they've stopped doing it. And if they were planning to do it, they've also changed their plan and they're now not doing it. Um, which is, um, yeah, so I, actually I don't know whether, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure and it might be that your um, tin, your recent conversations with Sporting Men have shed some light on, on alternatives, but I don't know if, if the plan we previously had for this um, is actually as viable as it, it seemed to be in terms of publishers don't seem to want to do this because that's not the way they're thinking about this now. Um, and more recently with the virtual campaign, this new formal criteria met self-certification approach where people basically tick a box to say, I've 
checked and I'm happy and that's enough. Um, it, and self, that kind of self-certification seems to be um, more interesting. So, and I don't know where that's going because obviously that's that's still early and, and it's being um, it's being kind of kind of discussed at the moment with all the implementers for virtual. So, um, so yeah. So I, I so so the, the I think the proposal before was um, responding to requirements that may not be um, clear anymore. And I and I guess my my thought following all of that was that to have a, a robust discussion that out, that results in an, a new spec it might be worth actually having those people that would implement such a spec, you know, those publishers involved in that discussion and, and committing to it. Because I think that it seems like when in all of these cases, we thought, well, if we can get a spec out, then that will en enable these people to do what they're doing. But if ultimately no one's going to actually do it, then it doesn't seem almost worth even um, getting to the point of the spec stage because the spec isn't the blocker here. It sounds like it's, it's the logistics and the, and the, and the time uh, to, to do Nick, it. Nick, let me, let me, jump in there because I've probably got, I don't know, I might be speaking a little bit um, on behalf of others here as well, but my recent conversations with um, other active partnerships um, are suggestive that the, re the requirement very much still stands. Um, there's, a, there's a concern out there, not wholly stopping people from onboarding onto the Open Active programme, but certainly being a, a area of concern around um, how open open data is by definition it's open um, but wanting some kind of vetting to know that the quality of what they're getting and, and the, more not the quality but the, the safeguards are in place to prevent any content reaching them um, so and that's purely a publisher concern so that the, mm -hmm. the general understanding here is that they're receiving quality data if they're picking up the data from I'm in, obviously from I'm in, and that's been well vetted and they know it's standardized um, so that they're getting good quality. But whether it's safe is um, is the big question and the inability for them to have any kind of approval um, is a concern, not a barrier, but a snag um, probably is, is best to best define us, but it's very much alive. So, so this is so I've heard that from everyone who wants to use the data consistently yeah. i totally yeah totally i mean I, and people have been saying that i think since you know since day one how do we know that there's not going to be abuse in the system etc um i guess i guess my question is on the other side so absolute data users want this but who is going to do the actual vetting from your discussions like who's actually going to be going through every single instructor checking the pdfs they send through of the certificates are valid checking the clb checks haven't been forged like who's going to do that manual work? Because I guess that seems to be the the, the gap. I don't, have you had any information on that? The, the only we we look, we investigated this very lightly, and it wasn't me leading on it. Um, I left it with my uh, far far more expert technology team. Um, the, the there's two things we looked at. One physical, the challenges the challenges um, high because you are not vetting the actual activity um, and that's very difficult to do obviously you've got all the precursors to, to quality quality checking and certifying but again hugely manual um, we we have given this more thought recently with the virtual piece we um, i don't know how far investigation got us whether there was a solution out there we considered looking for um, similar technology to what might be in place around browser browser use whereby if you try and enter a site that know that the browser knows you need to be of a certain age for or similar um, that it can that it can put flags up about that whether whether there's any sort of um, better higher level tracking to know you're going to an unsafe place or or similar to be able to when you're clicking a url sort of warn someone before they go into go into that space um, and we haven't found a solution on that yet but that was our only sort of things that we could be doing either on a pub on a publisher side or a aggregator side looking to try and put some controls in place around the what urls people are using so, so in that case you would be the person going through that it's obviously virtual is easier because like you say you don't need to actually go to the sessions or, or the checks maybe slightly easier um mm -hmm. but would you be the you would be the person doing or sorry uh, playways as an organization would be would be doing that kind of legwork to get the information feasibly i mean we we've we've discussed it with um with with nish and the team to go to sort of are, are they a but it wouldn't really make sense for us at data source to do that because then we'd be the only ones checking um although that's good it's obviously a, a small volume of the larger percentage of data um so if it can be done at aggregation point that means it's standard for every it's standard for everybody um and benefiting from that and all data is checked um but whether it's even possible is another another matter um so yeah good if we can do it but we only then touch data that's in playways so 
Not just jumping from a similar point of open sessions, I, I, I haven't seen any way that we could be checking um, everyone who's registering. Um, it, even looking at stuff like Sport England's club mark, they seem to they they stopped that officially. Um, and I know it continues for some sports, but that even that process that was run nationally has, has stopped. I can't see us as own concessions having the kind of resources to be checking insurance and CRBs at that point. So I, I would I would echo the issue. I, I don't know who and where that checking could take place. Is, is there a better, is there a different model to look at this by? If, if the vetting is too difficult, which I've, I think is when I think we're looking at it at a, from a completely naive point of view, um, maybe made easier with virtual, but still very challenging. Would we be better to be looking at an implementation that considers um, the power of the review versus the power of the block? So um, taking a TripAdvisor model and suggesting that people can rate, rate a session and rate a provider that can be standardized as a way to then sort of if your if your ratings sit below a certain percentage we're going to stop stop promoting your activity um, because that's then getting the flag from the user albeit the risk the initial risk is still posed but medium to long term we can we can mitigate against that um so i think that my conversations at sport england are kind of relevant here in that well, i mean to a certain extent the question of who enforces it is avoided because it's devolved so in the case of NGBs, right, the idea is typically, although it will vary from NGB to NGB, that each club is responsible for implementing safeguarding measures. And what safeguarding measures are considered appropriate is defined by the NGB. And the NGB is responsible for auditing to make sure that those measures are appropriately in place. Um, and those measures are not really aimed at um, uh, checking that everything is safe. It's making sure that there is a process in place in case there's a breach. Um, so making sure that there are some named individuals who are responsible for ensuring that safeguarding within the organization is protected. Um, defined policy statements about how safeguarding is handled and that kind of thing. Um, making sure that everybody's gone through appropriate training and that kind of stuff. And there will be an annual review process for that. So responsibility really lies with the individual organizations. And if the organization wants to claim that it's affiliated with the NGB, it has to demonstrate to the NGB that it's met those standards. So it is kind of, um, it's not quite bottom up, but it's kind of like a middle level down kind of way of, of enforcing this. Um, even there, however, there is a concern that this is actually pretty heavyweight, that if you're a sport that's big enough to have an NGB, um, and or that considers it or, or you're um, running a class that considers itself large enough to affiliate then you've probably got the resources for this but if you're say a long-tailed yoga provider or something like that you probably don't have those kinds of mechanisms in place so there is a project underway for Sport England to look at more lightweight kind of mechanisms for safeguarding and again it's about making sure that people are aware of safeguarding requirements and demonstrate that they have a policy in place and that kind of thing, you know, much more than it's about doing, you know, double checking everybody's criminal background checks and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a, it is a lighter touch, more documentation heavy kind of approach, I think, than was envisaged the first time around. Yeah, uh, Tim, building on that, I, I, I don't know whether it's relevant or useful. It may prove not to be. Um, I just It's flagged something in my mind, really, in this discussion that um, we obviously do a lot of work with uh, British universities, colleges, sport, who sit outside the open data landscape. Their delivery would not usually, albeit they, they are looking at um, engaging in, open, in virtual open data, um, wouldn't usually sit in this landscape. But completely outside of us then, they have a challenge over the fact that their demographic is uh, student-based um, as a as an NGB themselves for higher education and sport. The risks um, around initiations and, and student experience of sport being coupled with sort of student behaviour at university. Um, this has been said so it's been around for 18 months, two years, albeit they've been looking at it sharply for that period. It's been around since the, the dawn of probably student sport. Um, they have spent a long time pulling together 
um, sort of policies, processes um, around um, how people can report an issue. So in this case, sort of similarly report a breach and the processes to how that gets handled. Um, mm -hmm. Much of the time reports come to them and if it's related to a specific institution, let's say a university, that report, report would be passed back to the uni that university concerned and they are they are mandated to follow certain pro processes to work out what's happened and the the, the following um, sort of uh, response to that um, and depending on the severity that can come back to to be managed and governed by bucks so in sen in the same sense i can see a sort of breach and reporting um uh, process potentially being possible and that being fed back to an ngb if indeed it was concerned a specific sport and provider and um, the ngb needed to handle that so it's I, I don't know who would do the first component maybe that's supporting the role but perhaps there's relevance there and we could probably learn something from bucks in terms of the process they went through to establish that and the challenges etc yeah with the overall idea that yes you're defining a deterrent so that yeah you're aware that you're going to be prosecuted and that people are alert to these things rather than that you're kind of preemptively uh, making sure there's no risk whatsoever um yeah that's much lower lower resource intensive isn't it yeah. so that's that makes a lot of sense yeah uh, yeah okay so that i think those would be useful conversations to have um Probably via Sport England because yeah, it's more than just a, a technical issue. But I guess the question now is, can we flesh out some kind of technical structure that is flexible enough to encompass this kind of option? Um, I have made a stab at this. Um, so I'm just going to summarize the feedback we had from the on the previous proposal and how I've tried to cope with that, given also the the shift in requirements or maybe the clarification about requirements in the last couple of months um so one piece of feedback we had i believe came from chris actually um was that it's one thing to say that people need to have uh certain qualifications in order to to teach or to engage in um an authority role um, but a lot of the time long tail providers won't actually know what those qualifications are or how to acquire them so we need to represent that somehow um, one piece of feedback we got from Izzy uh, was that we were kind of conflating safeguarding with qualifications more generally. So we were, um, yeah, we were, we were both dealing with kind of legal questions about uh, ensuring that no laws were being broken and no exploitation was taking place with, you know, is such and such a person able to, you know, uh, instruct in wall climbing or something like that. Um, I think the third point we've already dealt with, uh, it, existing safeguarding frameworks, we weren't really engaging with. I think we'd envisaged a general, a very general use case um, that maybe didn't answer the scene on the ground. Um, as Nick said, I think there was a kind of presupposition that there was some sort of authorizing body that was publishing these certifications and was prepared to enforce them and audit them in a fairly rigorous way. And that this would be like quite a high level organization. Um, and that seems not to be the case, generally speaking. Um, and then again, uh, also I think raised by Izzy earlier, it's kind of a heavyweight process overall. Um, so I've attempted to kind of shake that all up. Um, so the latest proposal, which is just attached to the same thread, is first of all, let's scope this right down to safeguarding and then see if we can generalize, because I think it is the case that if we address safeguarding well, something similar to that will deal well with qualifications for teaching as well. Um, but let's just solve one problem at a time and make sure we've got safeguarding covered before we try to make it a more generic structure. Um, I think we need to make safeguarding information more self-contained um, in the sense that I think before in the original proposal, you kind of had to have the whole ecosystem or you had nothing. Uh, self-certification was a little bit difficult to deal with within that framework. Um, the revised proposal is to make self-certification the norm, really, uh, but with the option of pointing from your self-certification up to another body and saying, this is the standard that we um, aim to achieve. This is our affiliation number with this particular NGB or whatever. This is the organization to which we are answerable. Um, Another difference is that 
the certificate, it was one thing that, that arose on the previous call about this was how often uh, audits were done. How often was certification information going to be changing? And I don't think we've really had an answer to that. And we went with the idea that it might change quite quickly and that say certification might be removed very suddenly from an organization if a breach were found, for instance. And it would be imperative to make sure that all records were updated as quickly as possible, given that change in status. Um, I think in reality, it's, it's like an annual review process at best, really. Um, just because of the of the overheads of auditing um, and even in the case that there was a safeguarding issue that wouldn't necessarily invalidate the safeguarding certification as long as the processes were being followed to follow up on that alleged breach um, there would have to be further investigation into that, but it's not necessarily the case that you would be yanking everything right away. Um, and then the final point is that there was a mechanism in there for trust networks um, in the original proposal. So the idea would be that you could say as a certifying body, well, we also trust certifications issued by this other body and take those as equivalent. Um, that's been dropped from the latest proposal, not because it's a bad idea, but just because I'm, I was sort of aiming at simplicity here. And that seemed like one of the more difficult areas. And I think we need more evidence that that's a requirement. Although again, Nick might be better informed here. Um, no, I think, you're, I think you're right. I think if, if we're going bottom up now and there's no overarching providers as the previous organizations were uh, that haven't, haven't kind of gone forward with that. Yeah, I think it makes sense to, to drop that until someone mentions it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it was, it's, it was a nice proposal and it kind of did all the things. Um, so I, I have this like feeling like it might be a question of like pairing back to this minimum and then building out until it looks a lot like the, <laughs> the original proposal was. Um, but what I'll do then is I'll just go to the proposal that I made, I'm afraid rather late yesterday. Um, so I would, I'd be surprised if anybody had had a chance to review it in any detail. Um, so taking it from the top, um, my analysis was that we had sort of six kinds of pieces of information that need to be communicated. Um, the first is um, information provided by the activity provider um, about what they do for safeguarding. So this would be something like, you know, who the safety officer is, who the public engagement officer is, um, what their policy is, and so on and so forth. Um, I reckon it sounds a bit R two D two ish. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm back with you. I'm not too sure what happened there. It's a sudden total drop. Uh, what was the last thing anyone heard? Uh, it sounded a bit like e er e er e er. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That wasn't what I was trying to convey. Um, Okay, so um, anyway, kinds of information. Safeguarding activities undertaken by the provider. Um, codes. Um, what good safeguarding is. Um, assertions that an organization meets those, those codes. Um, assertions about whether other organizations are trustworthy. Um, assertions that information has been published uh, by a given organization, so saying, yeah, we're we're the ones publishing this data, um, and then information about how to attain uh, accreditation and safeguarding standards, um, how to how to um, um, how to how to uh, find out more basically about a safeguarding code. Um, So those are the six pieces of information. Um, the ecosystem is opportunity publishers and certification publishers. Um, so anyway, I, with that kind of analysis of the previous um, proposal, uh, as discussed, I sort of thought dropping the point four about regarding trustworthiness of other organizations about building a network um, is out of scope for the moment. Um, so there's, there's a much uh, more simplified kind of data structure here, which consists basically, it's probably easiest to go by example here, 
consists basically if you're self-certifying of just some information about what you're doing for safeguarding. Um, and I just sort of made up these um, terms. I did a little bit of Googling around schema.org and couldn't find anything that answered exactly to a lot of needs. Um, but um, essentially that information is documentation, documents demonstrating your safeguarding code, uh, and contact points, people you can talk to about safeguarding for an organization. And that, in the context of self-certification, is basically it. If there is a third party certifying your safeguarding um, practice, so if there is, say, an NGB or something that does undertake audits, everything stays the same, except that you create a kind of rich pointer to that organization saying, here's the standards that we meet up to, here's responsible for auditing us, et cetera. Um, and then the certification publisher has to have some kind of simple API so that if queried with that identifier, it will respond and, and give information saying, yes, this person meets our safeguarding code. Here's the last time we reviewed this information. Um, here's what they're called and so on and so forth. So it's basically the original proposal, but really stripped back, I think, to a couple of core elements and with the trust networks aspect completely removed. Um, so yeah, in sum, uh, basically two pieces of information, documentation and people, published by the opportunity provider, possibly a third published. Um, What's that? We lost you there, sorry. Ridiculous. Um, this only ever happens on this call as well. Um, <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Um, okay. you, you say it's, it's about referring in its two directions you've got to there's an API that uh, is available on the certification publisher that can be called and that is what's used to check to confirm the um, certification that's yeah that's right that's um, and I haven't really specified what that API looks like it's really just I've just given a JSON object there um, which is yeah what the basically just indicates the information you'd have to convey, um, but it's not very fleshed out there. Um, so I'm sure other people will have thoughts to contribute there. Um, questions that came to my mind as I was drafting it fairly quickly. Um, security, what kind of security does there have to be, um, if any? Um, Generalization, so given that the scope was narrowed, how applicable is this model to other kinds of qualification? Um, schema.org modeling, like I said, I kind of dived around a bit in schema.org looking for things that would help model this. I didn't find too much. I might have even used too much schema.org stuff. Like digital documents seems like a kind of complex object maybe for what we're trying to do, but it seemed to fit the bill most closely. And then what would the guidance be for implementers? Um, so with those questions in mind, I guess I'm just interested in hearing um, initial feedback anybody might have on the general shape of the specification as it stands, or the proposal as it stands right now. Sorry, I'm not sure whether silence is. Everyone, I think it's, I think it's uh, it looks great. Uh, I, I guess I have a kind of um, yeah, like a sounds good. Um, although I'm not, yeah, I guess my 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 main concern looking at this is just thinking about the systems that would implement it. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a a big uh, there's a, a much bigger burden on the systems here to do to add those fields. Um, and I wonder if there isn't if there isn't a way that we can do something whereby a system can do that because there's two things, isn't there? There's self cert and then there's you know referencing the NGB cert. So like one way of doing it might be that the NGB can we do it so that the, the information actually lives with the NGB and they publish it, and then we just point 
a, you know, ID or URL pointer to the NGV that says, this is my certification. And then you, you, we centralize, because it, I imagine it also is gonna be different for every NGV in terms of what they allow exactly and what the different bits are. That's where the, the, the variance lives. Um, but if you've got a generic booking system, you, you maybe want to point to that and say, just, just stick in here and then, um, if the booking system is just a URL, essentially, it's just an idea. Yeah, can I just jump, jump in, in. And, and ask a stupid question, which is, could you actually explain all the stuff you just said mm -hmm. from, uh, say, the booking point of view? What what would we be implementing? So I understand there was the bit around contact point, but just a really kind of basic summary. How how might we implement the current proposal? Um, so yeah, I think I think most of the burden does end up being on the data consumer. Yeah, um, because there's always going to be some variation at the individual publisher level, I think, because there have to be contact names associated with the lowest level of the organization, right? The contact point is not going to be the NGV ever. It'll be the particular club. Um, the difficulty is that, yeah, if you're a data consumer, um, you if you want to give some kind of quality assurance, you have to do two things. Um, you have to parse the data object, which has the links to the safeguarding policy and so on and so forth. And I guess at a minimum, make sure that it's not a, a 404, make sure that there actually is something there that's, that's the safeguarding policy. Um, ideally, there would be a, like a human review process saying, okay, yeah, this is actually like a sensible, a sensible link. Um, and then verify that the, that the people named were actually associated with the organization and so on and so forth. If there's a pointer to the NGB level, uh, the same process has to be has to occur. You have to make sure that the safeguarding, well, sorry, I already checked that. Um, I guess then you have to ping the API provided by the um, certification authority and essentially just check that the review date is a sensible one, probably annual or something like that. Once you had those pieces of information, then you'd be in a position to put a green tick mark next to it. Um, if you didn't want that responsibility, I guess it would be about sort of copying those links that were provided to you. So saying safeguarding info here and here and trusting that end users would be able to, you know, check those themselves if they lacked confidence. Did that answer the question? Um, maybe I'll try and ask it again. Um, so from open sessions point of view, mm -hmm. the current proposal, is that we would add a field where the person who's uploading their session could add contact details for a safeguarding officer. Is that one part of it? Sure, oh yeah, okay, I see what you mean now, right. Yeah, so you need to have some points on your form saying safeguarding officer, um, safeguarding policy or safeguarding code that you adhere to, I guess would be the other field. Okay. Um, and that would be a link to either on their website or on the NGB, but the, the, the policy that they follow. Yeah, or well, I suppose if they were really long tail, it could be you know, an abstractly defined one, like safeguarding code for martial arts, I think is used by some NGBs that actually aren't martial arts NGBs. So it might be that they point to something, you know, just a link on the web somewhere. Um, okay, but that, and those are the, anything else? Or is it just a, a named person and a, a URL. I think in the first instance, yes. Um, and they're basically saying, "Here is our the information that we um, we complete safeguarding." Yeah. And then here here's the two checkpoints, basically. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's not for third party cert, right? That's just for. That would be self certification. Just for self cert, right? So there's more to do for the third party version. Yeah, I think for the third party version, you'd need the URL of the organization plus your. Well, for an NGB, it would be called the affiliation code, but yeah, some kind of ID that the organization could verify your affiliation with, yeah. Well, I, I, and a bit more than that at the moment, because you've got to, the booking system has to somehow know what web API for the various affiliations is. Yeah. So you would have to have like a, like a yeah, you, I guess you'd need to have an index file of those somewhere that all the booking systems could use so they knew all the endpoints or 
all the booking systems may maintain that information. Yeah, or the onus could be on the on the provider, I suppose, to have that URL. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's some there's some kind of burden there of, of how you find that information. Yeah. Um, my just jumping in there, I'm really conflicted here. Just to give my sort of user hat on, in, in that the importance of what we're talking about is is obviously um, uh, completely fully up there. Um, my concern comes in at lengthening and making ever more complicated the um, journey and route to creating activity data um, for people who are neither technology experts nor fully bought into why, especially in these early days still, to why they do that, especially at the grassroots level, um, by adding more fields in. And I, I don't, don't, that's not to comment on the importance and priority of the fields, but equally, um, the more and more we add to the standards, the more and more difficult we make it and uh, unappealing we make it to engage glo like globally. Um, so uh, my, my, I guess my reflection without giving this any more thought would be, is this the right thing to be looking at the booking system to start putting controls in? Um, I'm not, I can see why we're doing that, um, but, and it might be the only option. But it just, yeah, I'm concerned about the impact on a user. And we could be mitigating against lots of really good quality data and content by just making it harder. I think at the level of self-certifying, it's, it's kind of necessary. Just that the point, I suppose, is really to show that you've thought about it and have given it some consideration. Um, so it's a little bit hard to get any more paired back, I think, than here's the person responsible um, and here's the standard that they, you know, we undertake to fulfill. Um, once you got start getting to third party certification, I can start seeing how that becomes onerous. But I feel like if you want to address safeguarding at all, uh, you have to have that as a, as a, as a minimum. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree. I, I'm wondering. Would it not I, make I, sense? I, I agree on the necessity. I, I'm wondering whether uh, if this falls into, and uh, I'm certainly not a legal expert obviously by any stretch, but whether this falls closer into just an opt-in to agree um, to not T's and C's, but a similar style of behavior where we have standardized text that fits, that fits everyone to say, yes, I acknowledge that I've given this thought. I acknowledge what I'm doing. I acknowledge the responsibility I'm taking, but it being, far more than start far less than starting to provide um, a safeguarding officer and their contact details um, and more just an acknowledgement that I'm, I am aware of these things and I'm aware of my obligations the, the problem there is it then becomes something that's so generic that people are just going to tick a box and move on so um, that neither is valuable or invaluable but I take the point on the necessity so just to jump in here, I've, um, we've got a bit of experience with safeguarding um, on a project that we did um, with the mayor's office. And there, it, there's a, a more frictionless way of kind of getting people to self-certify through the sign-up process or through the organizer details. So they wouldn't have to do it on a kind of per session basis. You could kind of have some assurance that, once they they kind of set up their account they are kind of opt in or out of um a safe saying that they've they've kind of thought about and adhere to safeguarding measures and then you can kind of affirm that that's the case across all their sessions and what did you ask them tom what did they have to submit at that point so it was a bit different to this but they needed a um certificate which the um, publisher went through, but they also there was more check boxes on the sign up that kind of allowed people to give thought to the various different things, and it, it's a, a, a frictionless process. Okay. Um. So there may be a few different angles in which people you can kind of agree which are the components of safeguarding which will kind of ensure that you've got a, a tick as it may be and it could be ensure that you hold this insurance or ensure that your activities are suitable for this age range or whatever they may be and then they just tick on sign up 
and it links to further information for that publisher to kind of correlate it against the various NGB. So maybe there's a library of NGB safeguarding measures that they can easily link to and, and then kind of self-certify like that. My, my only initial thoughts, that makes a lot of sense, um, Tom, my initial thoughts would be, are there going to be systems out there where that model just doesn't quite fit? So um, from a Playways perspective, and I think this goes all the way up to even a leisure centre operator, um, who obviously don't use our system or any, any of ours on the call, that like we, you can become, you can be given the permission to, to do, to create activity for, through uh, after or at any point. Um, after your your own registration and we wouldn't certainly wouldn't want at we'll ask every single user of our system to um, acknowledge that it wouldn't be suitable for a participant um, and you can become a, an administrator who can create just simply by someone making you an administrator ticking a toggle so it's not that necessarily them being able to opt in at that stage i mean there are things we could probably put in controls next time they log in they need to confirm these things because they've been given that permission but it gets quite complex i guess at a leisure center level a bit, a, are they going to know, is every user of their system going to be suitably going to be asked that question and are they going to be a creator of content, et cetera? And are we asking people where it's not relevant to, et cetera? I just wonder if it's a, I can see how it could fit in a smaller, smaller specific landscape, but I'm nervous it wouldn't fit everywhere. Yeah, I would, um, I would, uh, the kind of head operators where it will become a bit more complicated. I'm more thinking of it from a tail perspective, but kind of the bigger operators by nature kind of have those assurances in place anyway and I guess the, the conversation is more about validating the tail so I guess it wouldn't be as much of a barrier maybe because I mean, could there be a combination of, of self-certification and, and kind of whitelisting so for example we we know that GLL all of their activities that they provide adhere to GLL's policies. And by doing that, we've got a whole, uh, a high amount of the total amount of data that is, um, has been safeguarded and approved and we can assign a tick or cert certification next to it. And then for the tail operators that use systems like open sessions, playways, then we get them to self certify. That's, that's a really good point because the requirements for GLL, so you could do that at the organization level in both cases, but yeah. the requirements for GLL self-certifying would be probably quite different. So for example, the contact point for GLL wouldn't probably be one for all sites, I, I guess. I don't know. Well, they might have a, a general mailbox, but maybe they don't so, have a phone number. So it would and, be like an organizational self-certification, which would be a lot more easy in practice to to get with the bigger operators because they kind of already have those processes in place right and then the tail one self certify well i think in both cases there's just a, the self certifies aren't there so certifications aren't there it's just that you're oh, oh, oh yeah yeah but it's not on a, on a on a session basis it's right. on an organization basis. yeah yeah i think it could be organizer in both cases so i guess organizers are big and small yeah just just on at a high level i immediately like the sound of that it, it sounds like something where a, work, a workflow could be created by somebody that is the workflow that you need to go through to manage your um your certification and probably provide some evidence i don't know how that would get managed if that's just building on that idea but there's a way that even at a, at a grassroots level people could certify themselves um twitter blue tick level um, and an easy way for us to manage the data of going yes or no this person is certified this person isn't against a single api endpoint um, so there's a there sounds like there could be a beautiful simplicity to that and it's aligned with other sort of other platforms other use cases completely outside our remit yeah i guess, I guess it plays with like what's that say for example what change for life are doing they have a white list of approved organizations which would be akin to the to the bigger guys and w what they want to do is promote kind of smaller organizations but there's no mechanism in place for them to um, understand that they've been safeguarded so in that use case that solution could work well i feel like probably the important thing here is is talking to those talking to the change for lives talking to the data users to see because it sounds like it sounds like it makes sense in terms of the data we're talking about publishing um but the question of i guess whether it's sufficient and then and then maybe there's even 
you know, second or third question is, is, you know, what's the technical mechanism? Because I can see there's, there's definitely a whole bunch of stuff we can do about like, um, conversations about the best way of, of making this possible with minimum work for each system. But I guess however we manage to get that information published, whoever does it, it has to be, it has to, if, if we do all of that and change for life, st still say, well, no, it's not good enough that we just know the contact details because actually we need to know that someone's looked at them. Otherwise we can't use the data. Then I guess that's, that's kind of what we need, isn't it? Yeah. I, so I'm slightly lost here in the sense that it feels to me like these are implementation questions more than standards questions. Um, like I'm not clear on what changes in the, in the standard as proposed, given the desire to create more usable workflows within systems. I think the highlighted thing was that this is probably an organizer level rather than event level. Right, right. That's uh, probably the only thing that was, and, and therefore the flow could be um, just for an organizer sign up process and flow rather than every event you create, which was part of the. Right, right. But, but I think you still want to. It gets complicated to publish a sort of separate organizer endpoint, I think, um, saying these people are certified for such and such. Like, wouldn't you still want the safeguarding information attached at the level of the session? Is that where this information exists, I guess? Because the. Or, or well, you have it, a, I, yeah, I guess it could be within the organization rather than attached to the event, but it would still appear within every event um, object. I feel like I either everyone's thinking or I've dropped out or I've dropped out. Okay. You power again, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually do as well, so I'm going to have to drop well, as well. Yeah, well, 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 back. Bye, guys. Okay, thanks a lot. Very frustrating, isn't it? Sorry, Tim, that that connection issue. Yeah, it's incredibly irritating. Um, so just on that, Tim, so you said um, if it was at the organizer level, you would still need it to be pulled through to every session, because we certainly, within open sessions, wouldn't want on every session add safeguarding info, but you might do it for the organizer. And then I, I guess if it's the organizer, organizer session, then copy and pull through that information. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, they would, be, they would exist in the feed associated with the organizer, associated with each event rather than living, because in the previous proposal, the organizers were kind of in their own data feed. Yeah. Um, and I think that complicates matters. Um, but so the, that's that's more the technical implementation, isn't yeah. it? I feel like there's there's probably quite a lot we could talk about in terms of the optimization of the of, of the technical stuff there. But but yeah, if it's an organized level from in user interface, I guess that's the first thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, thank you all. Yeah, we are at the top of the hour and we started a bit late. Um, I guess the next step is indeed to talk to people like Change for Life um, and also more talking to to booking systems about what they would find uh, feasible to do. Um, so I'll make a note of that on the end of the issue, and uh, I suspect we will address this again in future. Okay, thanks for...